All right, everybody, uh, welcome to the last distinguished lecture series of the year. I'm Marty Hurst, interim dean at the School of Information, and I first have to make this notice. This event is being live streamed and recorded. It may be posted on the web. If you ask any questions or make comments, they may be included in the live stream and recording. All right, out of the way. <laughs> so it's been a great pleasure to introduce Tim Tanglerini, who I've got to know very quite well over the last semester. He's a professor here at UC Berkeley in Scandinavian. Uh, he actually got his PhD here as well. He's a folklorist and an ethnographer and basically a truly interdisciplinary scholar. So very much uh, what we're comfortable here with at the iSchool as well, as well. He works with a combination of humanities, social sciences, and beauty. A really uh, unusual and exciting combination. Uh, so he has uh, many different projects, like too many to name, but one includes digitizing Norwegian archives and intelligent search engine for belief legends, which we're not hearing about today, but it would be cool to hear about at some point. He's had a lot of leadership positions at this interdisciplinary intersection, including the National Endowment of Humanities Institute for Advanced Topics in Digital Humanities on the subject of network analysis for the humanities. He's been deeply involved in the de development of the field of cultural analytics, including co-directing a three-year-long program at NSF Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics on this topic. And he's now co-leading a center here with David Bannon of the iSchool uh, at UC Berkeley on the topic of cultural analytics. Uh, and currently he has work in collaboration with UCLA, uh, focusing on automated methods for detecting uh, conspiracy theories, which I think maybe this might be a part of, uh, from social media, and with a colleague at Stanford, he's looking at K-pop uh, archives using deep learning methods. So really a great interdisciplinary scholar, a lot of super exciting research. Uh, he's also offered quite a few books and many papers, and he's currently co-director of Bids on that. So a very well-connected colleague. There's way more on the CV that I, I don't want to go into, so he has time to talk. So please join me and give me a warm welcome to Tim, uh, first topic on Parler Gay's uh, Conspiracy theory, conspiracy, and insurrection. Thanks so much, Marty, for that uh, substantive uh, introduction. I would like to do it justice. Thanks so much uh, for coming here uh, and taking time out of uh, really one of the most chaotic weeks uh, in in uh, in Berkeley's academic calendar, uh, although perhaps not as chaotic uh, as what I'll be talking about <laughs> today. Uh, and so. I'm just going to jump right in, and uh, if you want to uh, uh, badger me with questions while I'm talking, I, I think I could entertain the questions. I may not be able to answer them, but I, I'd be happy to entertain the questions. Um, I want to tell a little bit, tell you a little bit about uh, storytelling, folklore, and belief uh, to get you into uh, my perspective uh, on what I will be talking about today. So, folkloristics is uh, the the study of folklore and uh, of Folklore is really vernacular informal culture uh, and its circulation on and across social networks. So when we have that concept of, of folklore, uh, it's a lot easier to understand uh, how I'm coming at this particular material. In a lot of in contemporary culture, uh, this has a lot in common with social media where informal dimensions of story, everyday culture are created, they're circulated, they're negotiated. Uh, and we're interested in dynamic processes of variation and stability. Uh, how and why do ideas persist? Uh, how do these ideas support and create beliefs? Um, and we're also then interested between uh, this relationship between cultural expressive forms, uh, the groups in which those expressive forms uh, both circulate uh, and support uh, the structure of a group, and then dynamics include membership, who's in, uh, who's out. Uh, ultimately, these informal cultural processes become incredibly efficient at encapsulating uh, cultural ideology, which is really the norms, beliefs, and values uh, that any group uh, develops over time as a form of uh, consensus. Uh, one of the things I've become greatly interested in is trying to uh, formalize ideas of belief in this context. So we don't want to confuse it with truth, even you know whether that's justified truth or unjustified truth. Uh, Elliot Waring, uh, folklorist, uh, was sort of circling around this in a 
uh, now well-known article on legendary and rhetoric of truth. Uh, in the context of, of storytelling, belief is a social construct, construct uh, and it influences uh, the ways we are going to interpret facts and understand how the world works. Right? So through our storytelling, we're going to negotiate a series of beliefs that are dynamic. Uh, they're fuzzy at the edges. Uh, and then uh, that's going to help us understand how the world works. Uh, and then the true claims of a story, this happened to my cousin, um, are believed in the context of community in which it circulates. So that's part of the way that we have this feedback loop that makes the claims reinforce beliefs and the beliefs reinforces the claims and all of those circulate uh, within and then times across boots. Um, one of the questions is how does belief spread? Uh, and we've been modeling this both a simple and complex contagion uh, on some sort of weighted belief network. So there's a wonderful paper just out uh, by YYN and some others um, uh, on exactly this. Um, now, since belief is often related to causal claims, uh, it can profoundly influence the decisions we make. All right. So uh, one of the things that happens is the stories that we tell can influence the decisions that we make uh, uh, downstream. A lot of my work has focused on legends and rumors. Uh, so legends and rumors are sources of information that tend to thrive in very low trust environments or low information environments or combinations of that. So low trust, low information. Uh, legend in this context uh, should be understood as short, believable, monoepisodic narratives that are told as true, often in an informal setting uh, and conversational. So you recognize this from your own life experience as you sit down to pizza uh, with some of your friends, you share stories maybe about what happened this weekend, maybe you share stories about things that you're worried about uh, and you negotiate the bounds uh, of the story. Rumor, uh, which we know so much about, is uh, a hyperactive state. Uh, of legend. It's basically a legend that goes viral, and it often does not include uh, the uh, the resolution of the story. It basically presents, here's a threat or disruption, what are you going to do about it? Um, so to try and formalize this, I, I have to work with uh, models of legend structure. There's a very good one about personal experience narrative uh, from Labov and Valetsky, uh, where a lot of stories start off with a summary. Uh, they certainly have to have an orientation. This can be done very quickly in shorthand. This happened to Bob last week. Uh, and you recognize that. Then something happens. Um, uh, a lot of times there's an evaluation or commentary on the story. Oh my God, did that happen? Uh, and then there's a result. What happened as, uh, after uh, this uh, event happens? And then code is usually what finally happened. Um, the complicating action theory is always wildly under theorized uh, because it just basically said something happens. I think we can actually break this out. We can break it out in two parts, uh, a threat or disruption, uh, and the range of these threats uh, are limited and culturally determined. Uh, so if we don't think uh, of electricians or plumbers as a particularly threatening group, unless you own a house in sort of the Bay Area, <laughs> Uh, you aren't going to tell stories about them being threatening. <clears throat> um, but we have other culturally determined uh, threats. Um, for example, uh, in the Philippines, the tikbalan uh, is, is threatening. But if you've never heard of a tikbalan, maybe you'll turn that into a Korean tukabi, or maybe you'll turn it into a uh, adrenaline or something like that. And each one of these threats in our storytelling, we countermand with some sort of strategy. Uh, what are you going to do about it? And then the success or failure of that strategy can be seen as a, a rank list, an ideological evaluation uh, of possible strategies for counteracting a threat. So here's a threat. What should we do about it? Here's some strategies. These are the things that we can do. Uh, and then in the storytelling, that one worked, that one didn't work. That gives me an ideological evaluation. And by knowing that, uh, it's basically uh, the, the Ghostbusters question, right? When ghosts appear in the neighborhood, who are you going to call? Uh, the way you answer that uh, tells me an awful lot about you and your group, right? You might be calling Ghostbusters. I might be calling the Lutheran minister if I'm a 19th century Danish peasant, right? 
So there, there, there's a lot of ideology uh, there. And these threats and disruptions are, are linked to the shares and fears concerned with the group. So if I could estimate the range of uh, uh, fears uh, and threats that a group might have, and then I can uh, also find the proposed range of strategies, uh, I start to get a, a very good understanding of uh, the, the, the cultural ideology of that group. Uh, so all of these strategies are, are seen as culturally acknowledged, as potentially efficacious. The very sweet film that was made in the, I think, 1970s or 1980s called The Exorcist, uh, about a young girl uh, who gets possessed by Satan. Uh, and if you watch that film closely and you sort of take it apart, you'll see that it's actually fundamentally a, 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 a fairly conservative Catholic film where the family is torn apart by divorce. Uh, they're Hollywood people, right? Uh, and uh, the result is a threat to their most important person, that is to say their daughter, their family, future generations. Uh, and at first, she falls down the stairs backwards, spitting blood. And mom thinks, oh, I'll use Tylenol. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever looked on the label on Tylenol. Tylenol does not work against Satan. <laughs> so they go to the physician. The pediatrician says the antibiotics probably should have been anti-satanics. Uh, those might have worked. Then you go to a room filled with scientists. None of those work. It's not until you go to Georgetown and the Department of Exorcism. Apparently they have uh, <laughs> that you, you actually find the efficacious strategy for dealing with this. That's really interesting. So that means that in stories, we often cycle through possible strategies. And, and ultimately, I'm going to endorse uh, strategies and have a, a, a kind of a rank list of outcomes. I want my daughter to not be possessed by Satan. Uh, that's usually ranked pretty high, uh, whereas, you know, possessed by Satan is, is low, depending on your community. Um, and so we can come up with these, these, these catalogs and rankings of strategies for proposed dealing with threats or disruptions, and then their eventual outcome, right? If we did this, then this might be the outcome. Uh, and if it's, if it's not uh, retrospective, but if it's prospective, it'd be, I think we should do this because I think the outcome would be bad. Um, and so that's important uh, to understand. One of the questions that, that came up over the past year was I was wondering why so much fear. Uh, and I was at a wonderful uh, conference uh, in, in Santa Fe on, on contagion, complex contagions. Uh, and one of the people there presenting was a, a neuroscientist who was talking about uh, these low road and high road uh, fear circuits, mostly done with, with a visual cortex. But she was wondering if we could perhaps do this uh, with narrative. Uh, and so um, I'm part of a group now um, where we're starting to look at both narrative and fear responses, uh, threat responses uh, to narrative. And so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, that might give us some more things to work on. So let's go to social media. Why, how, how do we make the jump from storytelling in everyday life to, to social media? Uh, one of the things that's important here is this idea of virtual communities. Now, recall George Boole, and I give you a moment to ponder George Boole from the 1850s, talking about discourse. Uh, and in every discourse, whether of the mind conversing with its own thoughts or of the individual in its intercourse with others, there is an assumed or expressed limit within which the subjects of its operation are confined. So that limits the range of things that you can be talking about that's going to uh, uh, resonate with the group that you're talking with, right? So when we're on social media, we want our, we like those thumbs ups, we want our, our, our posts uh, to resonate. Uh, if they don't resonate, they sort of disappear uh, in, into the feed. Uh, now, working with stories on social media is, can be difficult because, as many of you know, they're notoriously fragmenting, fragmentary. They allude to uh, other conversations and earlier threads, uh, or even on other forums and platforms. So how do you how do you uh, bring that together? Uh, nevertheless, in the aggregate, posts and discussions constitute, in my mind, a collaborative storytelling process, which honestly most storytelling processes are. Right, most storytelling processes are a give and take. Right, we sit down, we start telling the story. You don't like the way I'm telling it, so that's not the way it goes. Uh, or you sit down, uh, it's, it's those rare things, you know, uh, you're an, a trained epic singer, people will pay attention to your epic singing. Um, uh, but in the most part, the informal storytelling we do uh, is, is a give and take. 
uh, and it's a collaborative process that ultimately self-defines the bounds of its discourse. Right. So we want to then see if we can uh, uh, find uh, find that. Uh, we want to find the actants uh, in this space, and we want to figure out if they're insiders or outsiders. Uh, we want to see the negotiation over what happened uh, and um, origin and status of potential threats and consideration of possible strategies uh, and a retrospective <coughs> evaluation of end results. You know, a lot of this is built on this illusion of close homogeneous communities, right? Uh, in real life, you know, we have friends, we talk to them, they have social breaks that they put on our conversation. Uh, if you start kind of going off, veering off uh, topic, people will bring you back in. Uh, uh, people will also um, uh, warn you when um, you're perhaps um, bringing things up that don't make any sense in the context of this group, right? So if you start conspiracy theorizing, uh, uh, well, this is kind of interesting, you know, so at, at, at Thanksgiving, we always think of the crazy uncle, right? And they're the one telling all of those stories and, and people are kind of, turns out I'm the crazy uncle in my family. I did not know this uh, until it's past Thanksgiving. Uh, but communication can be slowed down in this sense. It's very different than uh, online where uh, one actually can sit down to pizza and beer with uh, malevolent robots is something that we try to avoid uh, in everyday life. Um, so you're probably wondering, so what? Uh, what is the relationship between stories and action? Uh, a lot of times people are saying, oh, well, that just happens online. There's no real world uh, impact. And I thought that's not how stories work. Uh, Michel de Chateau has a wonderful idea about stories presenting repertoires of schemas of action. Uh, and so social media offers you uh, an opportunity for a collective exploration of those Schemas, and Ann Swidler mentions that stories present a toolkit of habits, skills, and styles. So we can construct those strategies uh, of action. Uh, and so that might bring us to things like uh, COVID-19 vaccination uh, and other types of conspiracy theories uh, that uh, led people to uh, uh, action based on these uh, social media storytelling. So, one of the things that I've been trying to do is, is uh, estimate the underlying narrative framework structures uh, behind uh, lots of these uh, informal uh, social media uh, virtual communities. And by that, I mean, can I find that those bounds that Boole hypothesized uh, looking at the interact and interact and uh, network uh, that we can uh, extract from these very noisy um, conversations. One of the things that we noticed in, in, a, in a lot of our work was that the frameworks tend to have considerable stability across time once they're established. So there's a ramp up period in a conversation, you get a, a narrative community, and then it's very hard to uh, perturbate that. Uh, this goes back to actually some work that Walter Anderson did in uh, Estonia in the uh, early uh, 1900s. Uh, looking at the idea of the establishment of, of tradition dominance. So once you've got an actant that fulfills a particular role and it's well known in the community, it's very hard to supplant it. So if we have, for example, here, a Yeti or an abominable snowman, uh, if I tell you stories about um, a, uh, a snow monster by some other name, the next time you tell that story, you're going to swap that back to abominable snowman. So this is just something that we do. It's he called it the law of self-correction. I think it's a network effect, right? So there's a, a, a network um, contagion effect here, that there's a stability that's kind of built into these network features. Uh, so we started to wonder how are these narrative networks held together? Are there certain topological features of the narrative framework that tell us something about the narrative, belief in community, uh, and are there certain features of narrative topologies that are more important uh, than others in solidifying uh, ideology? To do this, we took lots and lots of uh, social uh, media forms uh, and ran it through this incredibly baroque uh, pipeline. Um, I can give you the, the reference to this. And a lot of this is now antiquated with the, the, the rapid uh, developments in, in LLM. So we're using some NLP stuff, uh, and but we've been now swapping out modules with more LLM dependent uh, modules and, and getting uh, not only better results, but also thinking of different ways of querying 
uh, the, the overall social network space. Ultimately, the model is, is sort of based on this, that there's, you know, events, uh, there's news, there's social media, there's an interaction between the two, and people are participating in both. There's some sort of information loss. Uh, and then uh, we want to come up with some sort of representation layer to expose the narrative structure uh, that uh, is being activated uh, when uh, uh, people uh, sample those graphs to tell uh, a story and to understand as well that topologically uh, in those narrative graphs, uh, there are certain features uh, that are redolent of um, some types of discussions. For example, conspiracy theory seems to have a, a specific uh, a predictable um, uh, topology as opposed to say something like uh, the news uh, about Bridgegate and actual conspiracy. The other thing is we don't just want to stop at, 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 at sort of a satellite overview. We want to move through different scales of analysis. And so this is this macroscopic analysis that Kathy Burner has talked about, uh, visions of the whole, uh, which allow us to synthesize related elements and detect patterns at multiple scales uh, of analysis. And so a lot of our work is trying to move between these different scales of analysis and learn something from each of those scales of analysis that can inform our, our work on these other scales. Uh, so uh, over the years, I've, we've done a series of experiments. Uh, one was on anti-vaccination movements. Uh, one was on the rise of QAnon. Uh, and one was on a conspiracy in the time of COVID. Uh, in the anti-vaccination narratives, uh, what we discovered as we, as we extracted all of these things, these are vaccine-preventable diseases as an asset. Uh, but in the narratives, the, the DPDs don't really become uh, important uh, in the narrative graph. Uh, and so that's kind of an interesting thing. If vaccine-preventable diseases are the threat, then the obvious strategy is vaccinate your children. But if the vaccines, and that's what happens here, the vaccines cause adverse effects that the children suffer after they receive the vaccine, so that's the extraction uh, of all of these posts that we found on, on mommy blogs, then the obvious strategy is actually to avoid the vaccines, right? So that's, a, that's uh, and that, that we saw uh, play out. Uh, with the rise of QAnon, we saw that the nation conspiracy theory of Pizzagate was extended to include many other narrative frameworks, but it was linked together uh, by, um, uh, by these very low probability links between otherwise uh, fairly um, banal uh, domains of discussion. So you could have a discussion about uh, casual mining in Washington, D.C. Right? You could have a fairly banal discussion about democratic <clears throat> politics. You could have one about, if you knew the Podesta brothers, you could have one about the Podesta brothers. You can also have a completely different discussion about um, satanic cannibalism, which is weird, I'll, I'll grant it that. Uh, but they go, all of these different domains got linked together by people interpreting the WikiLeaks dump uh, and finding edges there. So you can see there, we, we lined up, when we project this into a narrative graph, it's a fully connected component. But if we were to delete WikiLeaks, uh, each one of those domains of discourse would sort of pop out fairly easily. And then during COVID-19, uh, we saw uh, these disparate narrative frameworks it started off very fragmented. There were many different narrative frameworks uh, in our, our extractions. Uh, but over time, uh, the QAnon uh, connections were made between these disparate uh, narrative uh, frameworks. And so it became a, a large connected component, uh, one enormous umbrella narrative, largely driven by QAnon, uh, that focused a great deal on things like government overreach and technology as threat. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about how you're like constructing these networks, like the find edge? Oh, okay. So uh, I can do that right now. Uh, so uh, we're 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 extracting triples uh, from all of the posts, uh, and so for actants, we're looking at uh, sort of named entities, institutions, organizations, uh, and then uh, we we have to um, we want to aggregate them into super nodes. Right, but we also want to recognize that 
Hillary Clinton in one context could operate in very different ways than Hillary Clinton in another context. So we came up with this idea of subnodes and supernodes. So if we, in the aggregate, Hillary Clinton acts as one node in, in some very abstract graph. And, and then at the level of context, we've got Hillary Clinton in the context of democratic politics uh, and the edges, which are largely uh, uh, verbs and interaction between her and some other actor. And the actions we we, we relax from Renas's sort of narrative uh, grammar uh, to include not only things that act, but things that can be acted on. So it can be institutions, it can be organizations, but also places. Uh, and so that gives us, uh, you know, all of these triples, uh, any kind of hyper -rank, uh, so Hillary Clinton ate the children in the tunnel. Uh, we, we decompose into multiple triples. Hillary Clinton ate the children. Hillary Clinton was in the tunnel. Children in the tunnel, right? So it's not, that's that's a, uh, that's not a good solution, but that was the, the solution that was available. So I'd like to be able to work with, with a hypergraph model. It, it, it gets uh, kind of complicated. I think actually we've been over, you know, we've been leapfrog. Uh, by LLMs, where we can actually come up with some vectorization of these um, uh, of the edges uh, and and use information from that vectorization to classify edges. So that was actually probably what I was working on this morning. Um, and um, the other the other things that we tried with the edges to reduce, so we we can reduce the the node, right? So we've got actors and, and you know who are interacting with other actors. Largely, the edges are, are verbs. And so there was a, a, a group at, at USC uh, that tried using um, clock bank, uh, word atlas and clock bank to reduce this. But uh, their reductions um, uh, led to sort of incomprehensible categories uh, over those verbs. Uh, and so uh, I've been working now on coming up with a different way of classifying those edges. Uh, and I'll show you that in the context of uh, of parlor. Does that begin to? Uh, yeah, that's great. I guess one quick follow up is if you're doing network analysis, because you have all these phrases out there, I'm not really sort of imagining the network component because someone is tweeting about how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you a question part of it. Oh, oh, so uh, it's saying that we've got so many nut cases out there who are tweeting about how the lady is eating children. Uh, wouldn't we uh, wouldn't we wind up uh, just with one giant connected component? Uh, and uh, we do, uh, but uh, when we aggregate, like Hillary's children, Hillary's children, Hillary's children, we aggregate that and give it away. Um, at the at the end, once we, we also do a little bit of clustering, right? So we were going to cluster these things, and then we look for uh, the robustness uh, of of the uh, uh, of the network. Uh, and it turns out that a real conspiracy, something like Bridgegate, has so many uh, interactive connections from so many different many areas uh, that that network is is really not only a giant connected component, but it's it's. Is incredibly robust. In fact, you can take out all of the actors uh, of uh, Bridgegate and you still have uh, a single giant connected component. Whereas with uh, something like Pizzagate, uh, when we deleted those edges that were largely coming from the, the, the crazy speaking about, you know, uh, the interpretation of uh, the WikiLeaks dump, uh, we got these, we got these uh, separate uh, connected components. Right, the communities that we had discovered before. So there, that's the topological feature that I was talking about. So we can perturbate these, these uh, or we can attack these networks and we can see how they, they fall apart. The problem with that, of course, uh, and it, it's obvious, like, well, why don't we just attack the edges that make this conspiracy theory fall apart? Right after this, uh, but it takes five minutes for this person to come back and put the edges back in. So it's like Terminator 2, right? The network is like Terminator 2 for a conspiracy theory. I was going to ask in that case where you can uh, <clears throat> remove one component and then you things go from one component connected to multiple yeah. ones, could that be a sign that somebody is trying to alter the legend deliberately versus a more organic? Yeah, oh, yeah. So this is the whole narrative framework, 
right? So there, there's all sorts of opportunities for manipulation of that narrative framework. Uh, and so if you want to, uh, uh, you know, add to the narrative framework, you're also going to have to get resonance. So um, if something shows this uh, ability to fall apart, then my suspicion is that that's redolent of a conspiracy theory. That's sort of like, oh, look for that, right? So if there's, you know, these high clustering coefficients and the edges, when you look at the edges between the community, with, you know, wait a second, this we can classify as, as uh, looney tunes. Uh, then we can, we can break them into these different uh, discourses. But there's a difference between a conspiracy theory that people maybe believe and, and somebody deliberately trying to that's that's a, that's an open question. I, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of uh, that, that's a really it's a great one, right? And that's what we're trying to look at. Is is I so wondering if you can detect that. Yeah, no, I mean, not now, uh, but I hope to, right? I mean, I think that would be incredibly helpful. Um, anyways, this brings us. Uh, are, are we good? Can I continue on to? Yeah. Well, I, I I'll let you finish if you need to finish to all your time. Here. But I do have some questions just about um, kind of actually following up on my discussion about differentiating tactical mobilization versus some of the storytelling that you're telling. And maybe you're going to give this example. Uh, you might get into it right here. Jurists. Yes. yes. <laughs> 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 so uh, just a, a a brief refresher uh, on January sixth. Uh, and also uh, a horrible stamp that I asked Dolly to create to commemorate the uh, events of January 6th. Yeah. Um, um, uh, uh, January 6th, it was to say, going backwards in time, there was a Save America rally uh, where the official Park Service's application by Women for America First uh, did not include the march to the Capitol. Uh, on January 4th, there was a Capitol Police report warning of potential violence. December 28th, Fox sends a letter to Georgia asserting a DOJ investigation. December 18th, Trump announces the rally. December 12th, there's a Proud Boys March. December 1st, Barr announces there was no election fraud. November 23rd, they had filed the application for the rally uh, well before it's announced. November 14th, there's the Million MAGA March. Uh, November 10th, there's Twitter, Facebook, and others who Barr stopped the steal from their platform. And November 4th is the election. Um, and so, we uh, uh, went to look uh, at, at the parlor um, uh, platform, uh, which became incredibly important in the context of uh, people being barred from other platforms. So it was a haven for self-described patriots. Uh, there was enormous change in the user base after uh, November 10th. Uh, it's a quote, a safe harbor for free speech. Uh, and it's a little bit different than Twitter in, in that you have up to a thousand characters uh, for your parlay. Uh, and then the uh, the platform went abruptly offline on January 10th, uh, and moments before it went offline, apparently, uh, the entire platform was scraped, and it's been made publicly available. Uh, it's broken into two parts. We only downloaded uh, the, um, the content part and deleted uh, all of the user data. We weren't interested in the user network. Uh, and uh, it was it was too big to analyze everything uh, from our perspective. Uh, so we we did some cleaning on it. We got rid of videos, we got rid of uh, URLs, emojis, uh, highly repetitive text. And then we had the sample because um, uh, the compute resources just weren't in my group up to it. Uh, so what did we do? We downloaded the parlor data set. Uh, we used the pipeline uh, that we used for uh, COVID-19 and for uh, vaccine hesitancy uh, to discover the actants and their relationships. Uh, and then we also aggregated some of those uh, actants uh, into super nodes. Uh, we mapped those semantic roles uh, using uh, some semantic role labeling uh, to find their roles in these uh, sub-communities. Uh, we consolidated nodes into super nodes for a higher level of abstraction. Uh, we ran some community detection uh, to find the narrative communities uh, in which these subnodes were interacting. Um, so context-dependent uh, uh, appearances uh, of subnodes, uh, and um, and then we generated a series of narrative graphs. Uh, we used change detection to find meaningful bins based on external events. So we 
did a, uh, uh, what I call it, an agnostic uh, binning, uh, and then uh, saw how far off it was from uh, external events. Uh, it mapped quite well. Sometimes it front ran things, sometimes it followed on things. It depended on whether or not they were planning something or they were at the event or reacting to the thing. Um, we used these modular decompositions to find the narrative communities. Uh, and then uh, we generated labels uh, both uh, on, the, on the edges by, by using BERT topic, uh, which is a, a BERT based uh, topic modeling approach. And then we uh, generated labels on the communities um, uh, and looked at, at the, the topic label edges within and between them. All right, so it's a fairly complex uh, series of, of mappings. Uh, at a very high level, uh, we found that there was incredible persistence uh, in certain actives. Uh, here they are not as named entities, but just actives. So Trump, Biden, People, Democrat, America, China, Republican, God, President, and Obama. Those are the, the highest ranked uh, actants. Uh, and then if we just take them to name entities, this is, you know, a 50,000 foot view, and it doesn't really tell me much. Uh, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Sidney Powell, South Carolina. Those are all the people who were part of the, the Trump team. Hunter Biden uh, creeps up there quite high. George Soros uh, and the globalists. So that might be indicating uh, where we are in general. These were the bins that we came up with on our simple change point detection uh, in the ranking of supernodes. It's a very simple way of, of doing it. There are more sophisticated ways of doing it. Um, I didn't implement those. Uh, the topic models, uh, the supernodes, these actants give us sort of a, a who and where. And for each supernode, uh, we have context dependent subnodes, right? So we can think of uh, Donald Trump having many different hats to wear, although they're all red and they all say MAGA on them. Uh, and uh, we, can, we can look at these sort of micro narrative uh, spaces. The topics and the relationships gives us the how, what, and maybe possibly some sense of why. Uh, we use a very relaxed version of BERT topic, uh, but we restrict the number of topics to 150. We're trying to reduce that relationship space. Uh, and if we just let it explode, uh, we haven't solved the problem that we have before, which is uh, way too much uh, ambiguity uh, in that relationship space. Um, there are a few things that we do to allow uh, edges to uh, shift between uh, uh, between um, uh, between topics, and then we we set this uh, Ryman manifold that UMAP uses uh, pretty low, but it's pretty common uh, to find. Uh, labeling topics is is sort of like a weird uh, black art, but I'm a folklore, so I'm practiced at the black arts. Um, and we discovered that using a maximal marginal relevance uh, process uh, gave our uh, annotators, so then we gave them a bunch of different labels and said, which ones mean more to you than others? So we did this uh, back and forth. There were a couple of other ways of uh, labeling, but MMR turned out to be uh, the best. Then we only assigned topics to edges, opposed to covering both nodes and edges. So nodes are nodes and they have their space they also have their relationships the networks are created on the interactive relationship space but now the edges uh, are labeled according to the topics uh we tried using verb atlas and prop bank uh, as lerman and on did in 2023 but it didn't uh reduce this interaction space in any way that our annotators thought was good uh to give you some of the the uh the topics uh, Ken Swamp, Biden, Ruby, that already is an improvement over just the list of actives, right? So we are starting to get a context in which some of these, these uh, people might be interacting. The other big topic, the FBI, Flynn, Soros, and evidence. Uh, so again, limiting even more uh, this conversation. Uh, Democrats, communists, socialists, and communists again. So really uh, unequivocal where the, com the, uh, the Democrats are. Uh, the Georgia recount, of course, is enormous. Uh, then we get people like Nancy Pelosi and Kamala. Uh, here, Nancy and Pelosi would be uh, linked as a, a supernode. Uh, 
very interesting to see the, the prevalence and importance of COVID-19 and vaccines here, but that also goes to this idea of state overreach, uh, and uh, it situates this conversation much more uh, in that uh, realm uh, of uh, threat to the uh, democratic freedoms of God-loving patriots. Um, treason, traitors, traitor powers, right? So we're seeing a very clear differentiation uh, between groups. Uh, Fauci, clowns, snowflake trolls. Uh, then we start to get into some of the um, uh, news commentators, some of the platforms. China plays an enormous role here, but you can see again, vaccines, COVID-19 is, is really driving a lot of this. And then I thought this was very interesting. Uh, if we extended this label, it also includes um, Muslims, Catholic Church, Satan, Bible, uh, and, and Muslims. So we're, we're starting to also see the, the uh, in the topic space itself, uh, the very strong Christian uh, nationalist uh, element to this. Uh, we can do a, a hierarchical representation of these, these topics. So when we, when we aggregate over these edges, uh, we can get different levels uh, of nuance. Uh, but um, having worked with yeah, topic modeling for a really long time, I gotta say, these are some of the best topics uh, uh, I've encountered. It's also perhaps indicative of the incredible discursive control that we found on Harlow. People were not really um, um, changing what they were talking about uh, over time. They were they started on message and they stayed on message. Uh, and so even here with the uh, dynamic topic modeling, uh, where different labels generate the topic, uh, they, 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 they they track each other uh, unusually well. Yeah. I have a question about two slides back, the topic examples there. Uh, I mean, I've worked a lot with topic models too, and I don't know if these are different split topics, so I have to yeah. that. But how do you address the fact that the labels for the topics don't seem to correspond to the examples. Oh, yeah. Well, there, there are 66,439 documents behind that label. And I just took one of the, uh, the rank. So, uh, like, are the labels so, so the, so it's, what it's, proportion of the, of the documents do you think the labels really represent for each group? For each group. Well, uh, I mean, the, what is happening here is um, we're taking each of the posts uh, and embedding it uh, in this 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 vector space, uh, and then we're using the UMAP to reduce it, and then we're using uh, cosine similarity to find uh, those clusters. We're actually using HDB scan to find those clusters of this density based thing. So the clusters are there. Uh, and then it runs uh, the uh, the labeling process, and so the labeling process is is using this maximal marginal relevance uh, thing. And there's another set of labels that are using like TCPIP. Those tend to have uh, you know much uh, clearer you know high frequency mappings uh, to the the document space itself, but they aren't necessarily as as sort of uh, discriminatory as the with the range of words in that topic cluster. Well, let me ask another way. Would it, is it fair to say that the labels are just like a hint, but they're not that accurate, and it's really the groups that you're going for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The labels are, are and, and it, it's sort of over all of those edges. It's a way to reduce the the, the noise in the edges, uh, but we can always get back to the edges themselves, and we can always get back to the, the text, right? So the idea is, oh, what's going on in this little context? What is what are the what is what's generating this edge? What are all of the posts generating that edge? And then I can understand that relationship better. So then, like for the one where it talks about BI source, and they're actually talking about Pelosi and Schumer, yeah, and Dominion. You know, it's not talking about voting machines, whatever. So right. how do you reconcile those differences? Like, so this might be related to evidence, right? Uh, so using that as a first, as a first sort of uh, I see it's an or it's not yeah, yeah 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 it's not it's not it's not a one one mapping it's sort of like oh that's in that sort of space when I look at all of these things together. I just might be ready to draw a question, but from the point of view of this information, in this process we use to document 
got a misinformation topic. Uh, have you seen something like this? Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's one of the things that people are, are hoping for. It's like, oh, can I put, you know, can I put my stuff in here and you can label things misinformation uh, <coughs> or, or somehow other uh, information. Uh, I think it would, I, I think that's a, uh, a uh, an ancillary uh, problem. I think what we're trying to do right now is just trying to figure out how the discourse is mapped uh, here and, and make no uh, evaluation on our part whether or not the group that's generating this sees this as, as misinformation or, or even disinformation. There might be quite a bit of that uh, in here, but the group is collectively sort of sorting this through their sort of ongoing interaction with the platform. When you say misinformation or disinformation, are you saying that <clears throat> people are in intentionally making something else and saying something that, like the, uh, that this is a fraudulent election, but knowing it's not a fraudulent election? I don't think it's yeah, not saying that. That's exactly the, the, the problem. Here. So that's why we're, we're trying to let the data seep in and, and, and generate these graphs. Then uh, you know an analyst could come along and say, "Oh, I have a, I have a clear set uh, set idea of you know uh, now line actors deliberately trying to change the the, the direction of the conversation by adding information that they know to be false, but are trying to package in such a way that people uh, in the group will find resonant with their belief system." So I would call that like an attack. Well, I mean, people um, might actually believe that Trump was cheated and also put out false information to exaggerate mm -hmm. the, the reality. Right. I, I've got no way of measuring that in this. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is some of the most modern machines on this program. Yeah, yeah. That kind of, kind of like a challenging downstream task, but, but one party would find. Is every single post given the same weight? So initially, every single every single post is given the same weight, and then as we aggregate over time, different things get uh, different weights. Uh, based on what? Uh, mostly right now, based on frequency. So uh, frequency is like low hanging fruit, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm a humanities professor, so I need as much low hanging fruit as I can. <laughs> So then for each temporal uh, bin, we created a narrative network graph, which we partitioned into these communities using modularity de detection. Uh, and uh, because we're using the subnodes, uh, actants can appear in multiple communities. Uh, and we can find predominant edge topics within and across communities because we've done that sort of higher level sort of abstraction of what these edges are, instead of just having a lot of edges that are hard to figure out what the relationship is by, by putting in that that topic modeling on the edges alone we, we can sort of say okay let's condense this graph a little bit um we haven't attuned this to stance like what a person says i don't believe that trump uh won the election right that would be uh a, a stance right that person said i don't believe what comes next uh but now the way this is set up, we, we haven't incorporated that yet, although we do uh, have a, a process for doing that. Nor have we inferred uh, what people in the group think of as insiders or outsiders. So that's another uh, downstream task. Um, and then we also create an intersection graph for each bin to see what it stays persistent over days in that particular uh, segment. Um, a lot of times people ask me, why are we doing this? Um, and at two in the morning, I often ask myself that same question. Uh, but if we don't do it, this is this is the graph. Now, in some talks, people love graphs like that. Like, wow. Uh, but it tells me effectively that your, your cat has some grooming problems. Uh, so we want to disentangle um, uh, these bins. And so for the first day, uh, we wound up with these these different narrative communities, which I kind of call marking the playing field. Uh, and here we see uh, the Democrats uh, associated, for example, here with leftist socialism, socialists, uh, an aggregation over some of, of, of the nodes uh, by edges that are 
So what I did was I took the the the, the highest rank grouping of edges between two super sub nodes and gave that as the uh, this sort of meso scale uh, representation uh, of the uh, relationship between them. Uh, we see a lot of people like Bob Steve Mr. President, uh, uh, federal help with the Democrats is related to treason, uh, the National Guard with the Democrats is related to uh, lockdowns, and the Democrats, of course, are uh, openly satanic uh, and uh, related to Black Lives Matter. Uh, we also get some more detail on, on Biden. Um, and so right from the start, the, the conversation is focused on the Democrats as treasonous, perhaps satanic. Uh, and uh, in that sense, a sort of a, a, a grave threat uh, to the United States. But on the intersection, there's you know a lot of almost equal uh, uh, degree uh, centrality for for each one of these these characters so it's it's kind of setting the playing field this is going to change as we go through the different bins um and the georgia recount uh uh soros starts to creep up as being the main player uh in this georgia recount so it's almost like flynn and soros uh so the globalist versus the the staunch defender uh, uh i'm very interested that, that in the second Move uh, in in the uh, the following data uh, that uh, the Democrats fraud and communists were allied largely against um, the president and the American people, um, and ballots uh, uh, become more and more important as as um, uh, other parts that you think would be really important, like Trump. Uh, start to fade away. You can also see the patriots are starting to uh, rear their head. Um, the Democrats and globalists by the by the third bin have emerged as a existential threat. Uh, so there's a, a very rapid move towards this is the playing field, these are the actors, this is the relationship, and then it stays pretty steady uh, throughout. By the time we get to bin four, this um, plans for a rally uh, and uh, uh, discussions of things like war, um, uh, with bars, no election fraud, uh, we wind up uh, very much uh, sort of an intense focus on the Democrats, but all of these edges are then are, are really quite negative communist stems. Uh, Trump, of course, is related to God in America uh, with the family. Uh, here we're looking at uh, uh, some we haven't aggregated these into just one big super note. I kind of broke them out to give you a little bit more uh, detail uh, on what was going on there. Uh, by bin six and the Proud Boys March, uh, Christian patriotism, freedom, and the democratic threat, the democratic threat to the uh, the government uh, really become the focal point. Um, Democrats really take front and center there. So they really are what you're talking about. You're talking about threat and the strategies to deal with that threat and not so much the things that we've already uh, internalized. Um, and it just, it continues on like this uh, with these sort of existential threats uh, posed by the Democrats to God and country. Um, and uh, by bin eight, uh, it really is, both predictable and and the only thing that that's starting to creep in is, is sort of questions about about Mike Pence, uh, and so it's all of a sudden sort of surges in a lot of these conversations because people are worried about what Mike Pence is going to do, uh, and so he goes from being pretty much patriot, uh, God and country, uh, to being uh, potentially a um, a treasonous. Uh, Communist. Um, and so by the last bin, we're actually now at the, the time of the insurrection. Uh, and what's interesting then is that all of a sudden Antifa, which had been sort of low level uh, noise in the system, jumps right out. So earlier on, and I'm going to show you in a second, they were talking about Black Lives Matter in the context of we should also engage in quote, peaceful protesting. And so Black Lives Matter became uh, one of these potential models for strategy. 
And by the time you get to the aftermath, you can see that Antifa is, is closely related uh, to uh, uh, the Capitol Police. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a swap there. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, oops, I guess I forgot uh, that the uh, Antifa becomes the ones who attack the Capitol as opposed to the God fearing, America loving patriots. Um, so, one of the things we, we built into this was an ability to drill down to the underlying statements. So, earlier on, this is maybe around November 10th or so. Uh, we find this little cluster in one of the uh, narrative communities all about Antifa, Black Lives Matter, uh, and election fraud. Uh, and if we drill down into uh, this Antifa power, and we find this one of the uh, the phrase, one of the, the posts, we need to understand peaceful protesting of our opposing side and just raise the bar a few notches, um, which just taken by itself. Uh, you know, could be read in, in, in multiple ways, but seen in the context uh, of all of the other posts in which it's embedded, uh, it becomes uh, kind of chilling, uh, given that this is so much earlier uh, than we thought. Um, by November 17th, uh, we're getting things like, it's our duty as American citizens to resist this tyrant, by the big tech tyrant, with every fiber of your being. So there's a real rally around uh, uh, definitive action. And then it gets, it, it is also uh, pretty dark. Uh, these are much easier to find, uh, but uh, seeing them in the context of, say, things like civil war uh, and uh, the election fraud, uh, kill the evil leftist scum before they kill you, stand up and kill for your country, uh, take to the streets in your tens of millions of that's actually a fairly direct call. Uh, I don't think there's anything subtle there. Uh, again, early on, uh, about organizing uh, itself. Uh, and so this is in relationship to Michigan. Right, so we can start to see uh, how, uh, if we were just doing a, a keyword search, we would probably miss the context. Well, by having the context there, we can situate these uh, statements uh, much better. And we can also see all of the different uh, narrative uh, continuities uh, that exist uh, over uh, this broad thing. So what have we learned? Um, conversations on parlor were ideologically consistent throughout. There was very little room for dissent. It was basically an echo platform. Uh, news events were fit into an existing belief framework and the existing belief framework drove real world actions like the Million Maga March. Uh, the Georgia, Michigan, uh, and, and ultimately January 6th. There was a rapid escalation to organizing for violent protests very early on. And Democrats were seen as an existential threat from the very start, uh, which brought in fears of technology, communism, socialism, and race. Trump and the patriots were always aligned with God. Uh, the actions were seen as patriotic, and violence was justified and necessary. I am probably way out of time. There are a whole bunch of future refinements here that we're working on uh, that I just haven't had time to implement. Who are the insiders and outsiders? Uh, understanding stance. Uh, and um, using uh, structure balance theory to, to uh, assign people who we don't have a, a clear understanding of whether they're inside or outside. Uh, we can use structural balance theory to sort of uh, push them into uh, different groups. Uh, well, there are a lot of limitations, uh, incredibly noisy uh, um, data, uh, problems with my compute resources, graph generation, particularly the edges, present a considerable difficulty. Um, uh, I want to add some things from the Dodds lab at uh, University of Vermont, uh, looking at uh, something different than uh, it was got a different framework that looks at fear and um, uh, uh, power, so danger and, and, and power. 
uh, and then uh, uh, computational timelining to look at turbulence and chronopathy, uh, sort of narrative control and consensus. Uh, and then we're also working on some other ways for doing uh, narrative uh, summary graph decomposition. Uh, so taking the peel values uh, on these decompositions and then finding information flow uh, over these fixed point graphs uh, and these sort of the cut back slow diagrams give us a real understanding of, of how these concepts are, are working. Uh, positive directions, this perhaps goes to both of your questions there in the back. Uh, we can definitely use it for bad. Uh, we tried. Uh, it's really easy. Uh, you take chat GPT, you sample over the graph, and you get valid posts, uh, and then you add some robots, uh, and maybe you can hasten the end of the world. Uh, so bad, uh, we can do. Uh, can we do good? Uh, <laughs> no. uh, maybe we could possibly focus on strategies. Given a conversation, the strategies that are bubbling up, what other possible strategies uh, could be made um, uh, uh, appropriate, acceptable? Uh, maybe we can focus on results or outcomes, right? So this ends with, uh, you know, we didn't win this time, we didn't win the battle, but we're going to win you know, the war, uh, maybe there are other types of outcomes that could, could get a boost. I don't know what this would look like. So ethically, there, there are all sorts of questions. So thank you for your patience and, and listening to my mad rambling about Carla uh, and these approaches that come from computational book or six. I have a lot of collaborators uh, and uh, it's thanks to them that I'm able to, to think uh, productively uh, across all of these difficult Oh. Yes. <laughs> the questions from the audience was online because we have a question here in the back. Yes, kind of back to my initial question. So you started your talk with storytelling, which I think is a big part of yeah. of how uh, if you want to try to understand how how these groups mobilize, how these networks form. And then you, you sort of end your talk more on the structural elements yeah. of, of these communities. So I'd like to connect those. And yeah. one of the things that we've been trying to understand in our um in our group, you know, there's all sorts of elements. There's participatory elements. So storytelling isn't just a deep story that exists and then everything is played around it. This happens right. in participatory matters. That would be sort of one mechanism by which you can see a connection between storytelling. And structural elements that we're seeing in these communities. But I'm just curious, just, and you can speculate, you don't have to, because I know that you, you kind of separated these a little bit, but link the storytelling maybe to the structural elements that you've been seeing in the very high schools. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's a, that's a, a very important and, and like crucial uh, feature of this. So I start off at, at, as, as setting the storytelling, setting the storytelling of the, the 19th century Danish rural communities and trying to understand. Uh, stories of situated performance uh, as a way of commenting on rapid changes in uh, economics, agricultural organization, uh, and aspects like that. And trying to understand, you know, uh, the variations. We're always interested in multiple stories, uh, maybe around uh, a similar topic. And so uh, I was going to start off today's talk with a story uh, about a witch. Uh, that is told in a uh, 19th century rural uh, uh, community. Uh, and uh, she goes out and harasses the cows, steals her milk, uh, and then turns herself into a rabbit and pops across the field, uh, but gets shot uh, by a, a, a farm with a, a silver bullet. So why am I telling you this story? Right, so situated in, in 19th century rural Denmark, a story that's told is true. By a person who has a small holding uh, and only a couple of cows, uh, the threat of somebody stealing his milk is uh, uh, of existential concern. Right, so we've got, on some level, uh, a a method now for, for pulling that apart. What are the threats? Where are they coming from? What are they threatening? And what are the strategies for dealing with that threat? So now I've got a, a stable model that I can use to understand other stories uh, of witchcraft and other potential uh, strategies uh, and uh, negotiated outcomes of, well, we shouldn't have shot her or we shouldn't have uh, eaten uh, that, um, that piece of bread. Uh, and you can imagine uh, that, that this is taking place in sort of a back and forth. So 
Fast forward to the 1990s, I, I started collecting stories from paramedics uh, in Oakland, and riding around on ambulances, and they start to turn their experiences into stories uh, in real time. Right, so they run on a call, they get to the hospital, they drop off the patient, they come out back, and they say, you're not going to believe the call we just ran on. Uh, and they start telling it, and the, the audience is other paramedics. They're like, very skeptical audience. And then maybe it's like, oh, that's nothing. <laughs> Last night, we did a multiple gunshot car accident in our league. Fire, shooting, radicalistic. Right, and then they tell their story. On some level, I know that I can, I can have almost like a typology of the types of uh, actions that are admissible uh, into paramedic storytelling. Same way I could do with 19th century Danish uh, peasants, and same way that I can do with, uh, for example, your parlor or pizza gate or any type of place where people are negotiating uh, their storytelling. We're missing all of that performance when I do this kind of uh, structural thing. So I want to see if we can't put that back in. Uh, and so part of it is maybe we can estimate stance. Do I really, you know, what is my investment in what I'm saying? We've done that by proxy in, in folklore for years by looking at uh, narrative lengths. This happened to me, this happened to my brother, this happened to my brother's friend, this happened to my brother's friend's next door neighbor, this happened to some guy. I've heard about this happened 200 years ago to uh, somebody in another part of Denmark, right? So that was sort of the, the distancing effect of, of the narrative uh, cues. I'm not satisfied with that. Uh, I think there's more uh, of these sort of performance elements that, that lead to this ongoing negotiation. Social media is weird because you don't really know who you're negotiating with, right? And that might get to this this thing where <laughs> we've got a small community of malign actors uh, deliberately negotiating with you in a, in a way that, that pushes the story into uh, some corner that you weren't expecting. There was a, some ethnography done on January 6th, uh, which I found really interesting. So a lot of people have been on, on Parler. Parler was one of the big places that people were discussing uh, and excited uh, about winning back the country. Uh, and thinking that they shared, you know, these this cultural ideology, the loose values norms, with all of the other people they were communicating with, and some of them showed up in Washington D.C. on January sixth and looked at the crowd and went, "Whoa, wait a second, those are not my people," right? Because the one dimensionality of these these uh, interactions on, on social media uh, were were not giving them that. That fullness. We have a question from David Bannon. David Bannon's online when he asks, You alluded earlier to LLMs leapfrogging some of this work. I'm curious how you can envision them being used for measurements of this kind. Is there a, is this a simple throwing all of the parlor in GPT4 and asking, tell me about the stories, or do you envision something more structured? <laughs> yeah, so that's a great question. So uh yeah, the uh the first, uh, the first um, idea was, in fact, just oh hell, uh, let's just throw all of it in there and 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 see what it tells us, uh, and um, that that doesn't work. Uh, so we could, and this is what we've been experimenting with, uh, and and the problem is that it really is experimental uh, because I don't know what the the. the, the QA template would be, right? So you could question and answer, uh, have some structured questions that you're always asking uh, in the same manner uh, with some large language model uh, helping you uh, extract uh, a, uh, an abstraction of the information uh, that you're hoping to get out. The problem is, is that you may be then wildly biasing uh, the answers. Right, so your your your, your props uh, maybe uh, maybe may result in 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 the uh, the machine giving you back something that is that is kind of close to uh, that space in 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 the language model space. Uh, 
I'm not, I'm not articulating this well. Uh, uh, and so how do you come up? So we might start with some of these, these same questions though, uh, given a corpus, uh, who did, uh, who did Clark write a letter to, right? So then uh, who does Trump support? Who does, who do the Chinese communists support? The problem is that I, I think you're getting at a, a, you wind up with a very abstract representation of this that you can kind of get uh, much more easily. You don't need a large language model to tell you that Parler is uh, about uh, supporters for Trump uh, complaining, worrying, uh, organizing uh, to beat back what they see as an existential threat uh, of the Democrats. Um, Okay. Uh, maybe time for one question. Um, so I know you purposely didn't look at the at the user data, but obviously context matters, right? And storytelling. And, and if, if you do a, a sort of a demographic overlay of this, I'm I'm wondering how you get to you know what do we do with this without without any of the demographics about who the players. Are. Yeah. Um... Even if you even even if you do look at I mean we didn't not peek at the the usernames uh, even if you do peek at the usernames you you get a lot of things like USA Patriot uh, and then as far as uh, geographic we we tried doing some things with geographic uh, user data in in a different project uh, where we had uh, we were given it specifically uh, uh, for the study uh, and the people either don't tell you where they are. Right? Big Rock Candy Mountain, uh, well, or they lie about where they are. Uh, you wind up in the same problem with a lot of Twitter maps, which show you where people live, um, ultimately. So there has to be, it's, it's hard to get that, that, that close context. One of the things I'm eager to do, however, where I think we might be able to get this, is to uh, work with uh, Nextdoor uh, and all the comment lists on Nextdoor. Uh, because those are highly, highly localized, uh, and the conversations are enthusiastic. Uh, uh, but it, it might give us an insight, at least to next door users, how they sort of, and they're telling stories all the time. I mean, that's, that is just like one giant storytelling form. And shocking also <laughs> to many of your neighbors, right? Like, I'm shocked at what my neighbors would say. <laughs> and, you know, I was very, you know, not really surprised. Not a surprise. Not a surprise. Did any of you want to say a quick question in here? I think someone already asked this about the, the chat GBT analysis, but I was wondering if you could um, tell us a little bit more about how you see that connecting with the network analysis thing. So I think that's what well, we can get a connection. We can get the chat GBT data to. to Give us the network. I mean, I have people who joke that you know, they send anything they'll turn it into a network. Yeah, um, so. I think that kind of sense, and, and I, I really like networks too. But yeah. I'm sort of wondering, like, what sort of analysis do you think that would enable that we we can do with the like previous stuff like that? Like, this is this is pretty noisy, right? And we, we go through a lot of of uh, uh, gymnastics to get those sub nodes and super nodes, uh, and to even get the uh, the edges that we can. Uh, that's, that's, I was never very happy with the edges that we were getting, you know. Uh, it's the same word. Uh, well, because we were using we were using a parse tree, right? Because we were just we were parsing uh, over some small number of phrases, phrase uh, patterns, uh, and and choosing basically you get non phrases, you get words, uh, and you get you know. CEO kind of abstractions. Uh, that is a very uh, a violent uh, approach to, uh, I'm not going to say that color language is nuanced, but it's more nuanced than that. Uh, and, you know, we lose, we just lose a, a lot. Um, we've got these other things that I really, really quickly at the end. I haven't been trying to do other parts. Uh, there's a lot of, this is all very, it's all very 
you get the key kind of stuff. And, and, uh, that's why I think instead of using these very fragile, I don't know how much you've used like NLC, NLP tools like this standard NLP or NLP or NLP. Have you used that a lot? Yeah. yeah. So you know how fragile they are to things like punctuation. I mean, you know, right there. <laughs> so, like, okay, this is gonna, this is gonna end the race, uh, you know. Uh, so it, it's not, it's, I guess the term would be, it's not good, right? And so maybe, maybe something like chat GPT, or maybe, maybe some line trying to model would have a better way of allowing us to extract the relationships between nodes and maybe also get to this hyper model. That I was thinking about. So the relationships in a, in a sentence are often better modeled with a hyper edge than, than a simple uh, edge. Yeah. And I think then we'd have to learn how to work with hyper edges, which leads to a whole lot of different uh, level of complexity. But that's kind of a fun thing because then my career doesn't have to end, you know, at the end of you know, a day and talk like that. Like, oh, look, it might even be that. The work that we've done with the California reporting project is just sort of they do acquire across countries to kind of get back all this infrastructure data. So of this combination of, of uh, things like what you're describing, where we might use vector similarity to make the clusters and then use LMS to summarize what is in each cluster or mm -hmm. sort of break it down into a tree-like structure of yeah. Uh, so, yeah, LMS can be a pretty good topic. Yeah, I mean that's where we're hoping for some sort of LLM summary engine. Yeah. Uh, but that also allows for this macroscopic analysis so we can move through all of these scales of analysis uh, in, all the way down to the point where people are like hey if you need organizational help we can help you <laughs> I, I'd love to talk more about that we just did exactly that for um a case of police violence and they actually ended up getting a six million dollar settlement mm -hmm. of course it was a lot of evidence but like one yeah. part of it was the 600 emails um, yeah. that we uh, did this exact analysis yeah. on um, clustering into a tree and that, that revealed something. Yeah, it's really, I mean, 600 is, is enormous. This is uh, 1.9 million, yeah. right? So, I mean, it's sort of like people are like, oh, well, we just searched and I was like, well, it's, what does that mean? I mean, it's like, so all of these things are really hard. So, and the scale is, is you know, people, oh, it's only 600. That's a lot. And that, that's hard to find people. And then situated in the box. So, that, that sounds like great work. Well, let's let's thank him again. Thank you very much.